coming in. Okay, while uh, people are still streaming in, I'm going to get started here with the program. We're 701 right now. Well, good evening. I'm Joel Angelillo, one of the members of the Metro West Climate Solutions Steering Committee. We're all very happy you could join us tonight. The Metro West Climate Solutions is a partnership of local groups who want to speed our path to a healthier carbon neutral world, a partnership that includes First Parish of Wayland, First Parish in Weston, First Parish in Lincoln, Congregational Church in Weston, and a growing list of other groups. We hold public meetings and webinars on climate related issues. I believe this is our 16th session. Topics have ranged from Beacon Hill legislation to offshore wind to municipal waste and another 13 other topics. If you would like to receive news of upcoming Metro West Climate Solutions events, as well as events hosted by other Metro West groups, go to Metro West Climate Solutions, metrowestclimatesolutions.org to sign up. Uh, we'll put that email address in the chat for you. At metrowestclimatesolutions.org, you'll also find recordings of the previous sessions. Speaking of which, this session is being recorded and will be available soon on our website. So spring has sprung after a long winter, watching the buds, bugs, and birds return to New England is a true joy. But the variety of flora and fauna of which we all depend is threatened. I, for one, am looking forward to learning about what I and my neighbors can do. We encourage your questions. Please type in your questions in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, not in the chat button. We'll be monitoring the Q&A, but not the chat. So once again, welcome. And I'm now going to turn the virtual mic over to Jean Milburn, a member of Metro West Climate Solutions Steering Committee and one of the most passionate local voices for biodiversity in our community. Jean. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Claudia Thompson. Ms. Thompson founded Grow Native Massachusetts in 2010. And that action has given her national recognition as a leader in the native plant movement. During her extensive career as a landscape ecologist, she has worked as the director of education for the Appalachian Mountain Club, the director of Drumlin Farm for Mass Audubon, and she has served on the board of the New England Wildflower Society. She's a well-known inspirational speaker, and I know that her presentation will make us all excited to rush into our gardens and plant more native plants. Claudia, let's begin. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Jean, and thank you so much who's part of the Metro West Climate Solutions. I think what you're doing is really fabulous, and it's an honor to, to be invited, and I really look forward to talking with you tonight and to having a little bit of time to do some Q&A discussion afterwards. So I'm hoping everybody's seeing my screen at this point. Are we all good? Yes, we're good. Excellent, thank you, Joel. So this is a lovely uh, Northern water thrush uh, here in my back garden in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the water thrush, if nothing else, is one of the folks, folks, creatures who is telling us that all of our landscapes truly matter. And the challenge before us is, is large. Uh, there's no getting around that. It's no secret that both climate change and the loss of biodiversity are the two critical ecological challenges of our time. In 2019, September of 2019, a major report was published in Science Magazine. It was co-authored by 11 different scientists from nine different organizations in the US and Canada, highly respected uh, academic and, and scientific report. And the news was shocking. The news was shocking. The, the big story was that in just 50 years in North America, we have lost one third of all the birds that used to be here 50 years ago. Not one third of the species, but just in terms of birds in general, a third of the, the numbers of birds. 
and those losses are being felt across all the biomes, everything from woodlands to grasslands, et cetera. Birds are really great biodiversity indicators. Uh, they're one of the few fauna groups for which we can amass this kind of data due to a combination of both scientific tracking and uh, citizen science, which is very, very significant in the bird world. And so this is not just sad for the implications to this bird life that we love on the planet, but also to biodiversity as a whole. And the biggest declines that were documented in terms of the types of species affected, as I said, all, virtually all biomes um, are being affected. 90% of the population declines were in the species that we typically encounter here in New England, in wood warblers and sparrows, uh, were the biggest uh, group, blackbirds, larks, finches, flycatchers, thrushes, swallows, and even quail. And the other interesting uh, and sobering piece is that even common species such as Baltimore Orioles, hummingbirds, kingbirds, kinglets, cardinals, even, believe it or not, even blue jays and crows are, are being affected. There are population declines happening in those groups as well. The one positive note from this report is that quite a number of waterfowl species, ducks and some raptor species have actually increased in the last 50 years. And that's because of conservation actions that have been taken. So there are lots of things that we can do to make a difference. So the report itself was extremely depressing, but the good news is that this report was picked up widely. And I'm sure you all saw summaries in journals that you read, the New York Times or whatever science news. There were just a lot of attention went to this. So it was a combination of a depressant and a motivator to action at the same time. And I think it started to really get a lot of people concerned. What can I do? Prior to that report in 2016, another really useful report in terms of information and also very sobering report came from NAPKE, the North American Bird Conservation International. And this was an amazing study because it was the first conservation vulnerability assessment for all 1,154 native bird species in North America. So in the US, in Canada, and Mexico. And this was done on a species by species basis. And the sobering news out of this report was that one third of all the species were considered so much in decline that they are on the watch list for, dis for extinction or insignificant decline. So think about that for just a minute. 37% of the species were at risk of losing. And in addition to that, another 49% of the species had declining populations and changes to their habitat, loss of habitat, such that they are considered of moderate concern. Pretty sobering stuff. In addition, I'm sure a lot of you, a lot of us saw various reports about insect declines. There have been, this was a great report in the New York Times uh, from several years ago, 2018. And it really was documenting some studies done in Europe, in Germany and Denmark, where scientists looked at the loss of insect biomass. And one of the studies clearly documented that in German nature reserves, flying insects had decreased by 75% in 27 years. So we know that this is happening throughout the, the fauna world. And of course, we all know how serious climate change is. And increasingly, uh, I think that has also been a motivator to action in a good way because of the seriousness of the issue. And the most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came out of the UN just about a month ago uh, is the starkest report we've had yet. Uh, so the big news item there is that the estimate is that global temperatures have increased by an average of 1.1 degrees Celsius since the 19th century. And 1.5% is that threshold which is being used as a marker now, past which many scientists believe human society will no longer be able to adapt, that the impact to our coastlines and agriculture and property will be so significant 
that we, we will have gone past that irreversible tipping point. So we know this, I don't, uh, I'm gonna stop with the depressing stuff there uh, because I think the depressing stuff as a motivator for action brings us to the question of how do we humans get here? And what can we do about it? And how do we have hope? How do we have legitimate hope? And how do we decide to take action, which is tremendously important to so many of us? And I think to answer that question, the, I want to start very big picture for just a minute and say, what is our conservation paradigm? How do we consider conservation to happen in our world that we live in? Are we part of nature? Are we humans, are we nature? Are we separate from nature? And we are in fact, organic beings dependent on life cycles and just as much a part of an ecological system as is any other species. And yet because of the comforts that many of us have, the comforts of industrialized society and also because of some twists of history, we have in many ways come to think that nature is somewhere else, not necessarily where we live or not necessarily where we are right now. And so the sign kind of makes me chuckle a little bit because it tells me I'm in a natural area. And I, I always say, well, what is an unnatural area? Uh, how, did it, how did we come to say, well, this is a natural area? And what does that say that we have a dichotomy that we would say, well, that by implication, one area is not natural, but we have special natural areas. And why do we need a sign to tell us that? But I think the dichotomy in part arises from the history of the conservation movement in the United States. In the 1800s, as European settlers um, from other continents began to really destroy a lot of the habitat on this continent and the huge uh, part of the Native American societies and cultures were being wiped out and had been wiped out by disease and war. The country was truly being ravaged to the point that the conservation movement that we think of today was born. And it was really born in the latter part of the 1800s. And we developed our first national park, Yellowstone. A lot of the major conservation organizations that we knew were established in that same time. And the great side effect or the great result of that movement is that we began to set aside lots of land to say, let's protect it where we can see that we're causing problems. So let's protect these special places. But the side effect of that strategy, which was a needed strategy and an important strategy, the side effect reinforced unintentionally, I think, the idea that nature is somewhere else where conservation happens, but not necessarily where we live, work, and play. And I think that's the dichotomy that we are trying to re-examine today when we see the impact of humans on earth and realize that our approach has to change somewhat. And if there's anything that has taught me this in, the, in my lifetime, in my world, it is my garden in Cambridge. So uh, as Jean mentioned, I've worked for Appalachian Mountain Club. I, I've worked for quite a few conservation organizations. And I grew up in the era where the norm was that conservation happens on these special places. But I'm gonna tell you how that changed for me. And my story is gonna focus on birds a lot in part because I love birds, but also because they are not only a really important fauna group in their own right, they are good indicators of biodiversity and the health of our landscapes. So I grew up in this little town on the Massachusetts, New York border, Berlin, New York. And there I am with my three brothers and we had a hundred acres of working land and we were harvesting stone from, from the old stone walls when farming had happened on that property even though we were up the mountain. And we were very connected to the land. And I think subliminally, again, I was in this, I, I was in an area, I was in nature where I live, but I also had that norm of the world around me that said, this was rural, this is a place for conservation. Certainly we were connected, my family was registered as a tree farm and we worked with our state agencies and all that. 
But I would not have thought of a city at that time as being an area for conservation. However, if you fast forward in my life to 1992, uh, a couple of things happened after college and in between. One is that in the early 1980s, I married a wonderful, like, wonderful guy, Roger Booth, who was the director of urban design for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And as the director of urban design, he was an architect and an urban planner who was absolutely passionate about the realm of cities. And he wanted to live in Cambridge. So I wanted to live where you guys are in, in Metro West. I wanted to live in Weston or Concord and kept saying, let's go look for houses out there. And he said, no, no, Cambridge is my city. I want to live in Cambridge. And this is the house we bought in 1992. Uh, we struggled to find something in Cambridge that we could afford. And it was quite the fixer upper, as you can see. Uh, this was the back, the back garden, my back garden in 1992. And it's so interesting to me in retrospect, uh, my career path and my husband's career path, because we've influenced, I came as an ecologist, he came as an urban designer. And because uh, he prevailed in the debate over us living in Cambridge, I wanted to have enough land that I could at least have a garden. And yet I had never quote gardened as a child because I'd grown up basically in the woods. I once wrote an article for the Boston Society of Landscape Architects, and it was called What Happens When an Ecologist and an Environmental Educator Marries an Architect and an Urban Designer. And this is what has happened. I've had 30 years to learn a lot and to have my garden in Cambridge teach me a lot. Um, our house is on a street that has a lot of two family houses. Our lot is 7,300 square feet, which is large by Cambridge standards. Uh, except if not up to the standards of the wealthier neighborhood of single family houses down on Brattle Street, but it's probably small compared to what a lot of you live on uh, in the suburban area. It's also a little bit, we, one reason we struggled and searched so hard to buy a house is that we did manage to find this property that had these unusually large for Cambridge lots that back up to each other. So compared to many other two family neighborhoods in Cambridge, we have a bit more open space in the back than some neighborhoods do. And when I started gardening in 1993, I think I start, even though I was trained as an ecologist, I was doing environmental education. I didn't think of my garden as a place for conservation per se. And I started pretty conventionally, like most gardeners do. I would buy plants because they met the cold hardiness zones and because I liked their aesthetics. And I didn't have an ecological plan per se for our property. But what happened is that the 1990s was a time when we all began to pay a lot more attention to invasive species. And that became one of the preeminent conservation issues certainly being looked at here in New England and in Massachusetts. It was the time when uh, MIPEG, MIPEG, the Massachusetts Invasive Plant Advisory Group was founded here in Massachusetts and began to develop the official prohibited plant list. And as an environmental educator who was working in conservation, I jumped right on that bandwagon. As, as I began to learn about them, I'm like, okay, I'm removing all these invasives from our property. So here's a list of the ones that I, needed to get rid of in our lot in Cambridge. Uh, none of them were horrible infestations, but all of them were there uh, voluntarily as volunteers, except for the Japanese honeysuckle that Roger brought back from Arkansas a few years into our owning the house. And after it was in for a couple of years, I said to him, you know, it's gotta go. And he's like, what? It's, it's so nice. I grew up with this. And I'm like, no, it's got to go. It's going to be on the list. And we took it out. We planted nice trumpet honeysuckle instead. So, so that was a real conscious land management strategy. Uh, and I, even though I was evolving in my own thinking about gardening in general. Now, the other thing that happened is I did begin using more native species. And at the time, I was actually on the board of New England Wild Park Society, now Native Plant Trust at the time. And interestingly, even back in the 90s, they were selling both native and non-native plants at the time. Uh, it was not a time when people had become quite as convinced about the importance of natives. 
But I began to use more native plants and I like the aesthetic, probably in part because I'd grown up with them. But I also was learning intuitively about how my garden could become this woodland system. So this is a little snapshot from the woodland understory in my garden. And I began to create a space where those plants would renew themselves every year, the leaves would become the mulch. And I really liked that whole evolution of the cycles from spring to fall. But it was the birds that really started teaching me. Because by the late 1990s or around 2000, I had begun seeing many more birds in this evolving garden in Cambridge. And I was getting very excited about it. So I began documenting all the species that I saw. And I was quite convinced that the more native I was making my garden, the more birds I was seeing. Uh, this is the garden after I'd uh, done a fair amount to it, uh, 15 years in around 2008, a lot had happened. Uh, the neighbor had had a giant elm tree the, that had died. I planted these uh, Amalankia trees and a witch hazel because we wanted some woodland and a little privacy and some protection. My whole woodland understory is working pretty well at this point. And by this time, by 2008, I was absolutely convinced not only of, sort of the beauty and the ecological function of this approach to a garden, but I was absolutely convinced that it was doing wonderful things for bird life. So I'm going to take a fairly quick tour uh, through the garden, parts of the garden with some of the birds that I've been able to capture on camera. But this was the, the backstory to how I ended up founding the native Massachusetts. This is a group of beautiful Amalankia trees that have just finished blooming uh, right now at this time of year. And they also have nice fall color. It's nice to plant in clusters, I believe, because if you have a cluster like this, that creates a little bit more of an attractive uh, foliage and an attractive uh, view that will make birds come. If you just have one Amalakia tree, maybe they'll come. But at our Amalakias, we get a lot of neat birds every year. I love this photo because this is a Wilson's warbler and you'll notice it's actually eating a caterpillar. So the Amalankia trees, which are also called Shadbush, Shadblow, Juneberry, and you can see the berries are about to ripen, but they're not quite ripe yet, are really known by a lot of people for the berries which are edible to humans and loved by the birds. But I love this, the, here the native Amalankia tree is feeding a caterpillar to that Wilson's warbler. So it's a native tree that's providing both fruit and insect life that's so essential to birds. But as I said, the Amalankia berries are much loved by birds. Uh, cedar waxwings, if you have Amalankias, you probably have seen cedar waxwings come to visit. There, I've probably seen 10 or 11 species of birds eating the Amalankia berries. Uh, the cedar waxwings come, I swear, June 1st on the dock. They come every year when the berries are green and just starting to ripen and, and you'll hear the high pitch high up in the, in the sky and they'll descend in this small flock and they'll figure out that the berries aren't quite ripe and then they'll come back a week later as the berries are ripening and chow them down. Uh, last year, I've never seen a Baltimore Oriole in our Amalankias until last year. Interesting, the Baltimore Orioles love to be in the high canopy and so a lot of times they don't come down to the lower layers of the canopy quite as much. But there was an aphid infestation in my Amalakias last year and the Oriole, these Baltimore Orioles came in and they in particular seemed to love that little insects and they did a beautiful job of the pest control for us. And so uh, we had the benefit of seeing the Orioles helping to maintain our service berry trees. One of the things that I think works about my garden is habitat is that it now has a lot of layers from front to back. And even though it's a very small space, because I haven't treated it as just a bunch of lawn with a ring of something around the edge, because of all these layers and niches, which landscape architects might call rooms, one, one landscape architect said to me at one point, oh, you've created several rooms. 
but that's created a lot of privacy, places where birds and other habitat, uh, wildlife have privacy. There's places of discovery and protection. And it makes the garden, frankly, for me, a much more interesting place. Because if I don't take the effort to go stroll in the very back parts of the garden, I actually have, even though it's a small property, I have no idea what's going on back there. And of course, we have rabbits and sometimes coyotes late at night, even here in Cambridge. So a lot going on where they like the privacy and these secluded spots to hang out in the back. And I've been really uh, excited to see thrushes most every year in my garden. This is a very, uh, one of the thrushes. It's a very shy bird. It, it won't hang out up near the porch, but it will be uh, very discreetly in dark spots, particularly at dusk around the edge, searching for insects and all searching for insects in the leaf litter. And lots of uh, wonderful native sparrows, the white-throated sparrow here, always foraging for insects in the leaf litter. And if, I, if we were doing this live, I would actually try to demonstrate the little sparrow dance, but I'll, I'll describe it. Uh, if you know the sparrows, which are often ground feeders, they hop back and forth and they hop really quickly. And what they're really doing is stirring up that leaf litter or the ground layer to get insects. And that's so important to feeding them. So one reason is that we're losing our bird life is that how much leaf litter do they have in our landscape? Typical landscape that gets created in, in suburbia and, and has been created over the last 80 years is to just wipe things out, do a lot of lawn, bring in mulch, take the leaves away in the fall. And so we're taking away all of the necessary ingredients for the food web that these birds depend on. And with this loss of leaf litter and this loss of habitat, it's not surprising that we're losing bird life and bird species in the way that we are. Uh, Northern flickers uh, are, I often see in my garden, and you can kind of tell if you look at this photo if, right here, they are lovers of ants. Ants are their favorite food and they eat insects pretty much year round. Uh, they will glean for insects on the bark of trees, uh, but they are very dominant ground feeders and ants and grubs are definitely their favorite food. The back of my garden has, as I said, a lot of secluded spots and it, there's a lot of variation that happens with the rainfall. Uh, and so that makes, to me, I think opportunities for interesting habitat to use uh, facultative upland plant species, i.e. species that will tolerate or even appreciate occasional flooding. If I had boring lawn everywhere and was trying to even things out, I couldn't have nearly as many of species of plants and I wouldn't be creating nearly as much varied habitat that different species of birds or other critters might like. Uh, I live in a part of Cambridge. This is uh, what happens to my back garden when we get one of our three quarter inch rainstorms. And those are much more common actually than they were in 1992 when we bought the house. So I live on this solid clay soil. This was a major brick manufacturing site for all of New England in the 1800s. There were rail yards and rail lines within a block of my house. It, that where the bricks were manufactured, it shipped all of, over New England for so much of the building that was done. And a lot of people might dislike that, the clay soil doesn't drain well. But again, I find the, this potential for habitat interesting. And unless I was to totally bring in the entire earth moving system, I can't change it anyway. So, you know, love it, work with it. And again, that's where I saw the Northern water thrush because we had a really nice rainfall. And one day I was going out with my camera, fortunately, and I, that Northern water thrush hung out for a couple of days in my back garden on its way to migrating somewhere else. Uh, back in 2019, uh, there was enough rainfall that year that the back garden had a pretty sustained wet period. And we had uh, multiple, we had a small group of red winged blackbirds that use the habitat in our garden regularly for almost two weeks. So think of this suburban place, this urban place where I'm living on the streets in Cambridge, being habitat for red-winged blackbirds. 
And of course, water is a really important habitat requirement if you want to support bird life. Uh, here, I do have a small uh, naturalistic bird bath, uh, which I simply squirt out and fill with the water with the hose. And here's the tufted titmouse coming along with its youngster one year. Here's the gray catbird, uh, which is a regular visitor in my garden. And there certainly have been several years where the catbirds have nested in that sort of shrubby back area. Uh, I don't know if it was technically on my side of the property line or not, but it was definitely in that immediate vicinity. Uh, here's a common yellow throat warbler, uh, checking out the bird bath. And again, water is so important. I let leaves fall into my bird bath. And again, I squirt it out every few days and that just works fine. Uh, it's good to have some perching stones around because birds like to perch on rocks. Here, is morning, here are morning doves that like quiet secluded spots. They are also very much ground feeding birds. They primarily eat seeds, but they, it's a, snails are a very important part of their diet. They really need calcium. And they love to fan their wings, like you see this one doing here in a little bare spot uh, out in the sun. And some, they're just they're really quite beautiful, sweet birds. Some people might call them our native pigeon. Um, I much prefer them to the, the non-native pigeons. And one cool thing about morning doves is they're very fast flyers. They can go up to 50 miles an hour. As I mentioned, um, Birds like to forage in the barks of trees. Uh, flickers will do that. This is a silver maple at the very back of my property and it's a red bellied woodpecker foraging on the trunk. I've seen so many species of birds uh, forage on this tree as well as other trees on my property. Nuthatches, titmice, woodpeckers, flickers, brown creepers, warblers, red starts. And what's really interesting is that as of today, there are only two uh, plants on my property that I did not plant. One is the silver maple in the very back corner. And one is an old rhododendron uh, that's bright red at the corner of the house that was planted by the person who owned the house back in the 1950s. And we wouldn't dare take her red rhododendron down because she was passionate about it. But here's a view of my back garden from the second floor porch. And this was taken around 2015. And literally everything that you see here are trees and shrubs that we planted. So succession in our garden when we do plant woody plants actually happens, I think, a lot faster than we think. It's something to plan for if you can. I certainly underestimated how much growth there would be uh, in the beginning as I kept buying more plants and trees and shrubs and planting them. Claudia, uh, Roger started calling the garden Claudia's Woods, and he now calls it Claudia's Jungle. Uh, and we're actually starting to have to take some of the trees or the trunks down because it's just becoming so dense that uh, it's a little denser than we'd like. And then I'm just gonna point one other thing out to you. There is something right here called a snag. And we're gonna come to that in a minute, but I just wanted to point it out right now because there's an important story there. Uh, we planted, uh, a lot of river, several river birches, which are well adapted to the clay soil and the occasional flooding that we get. And up near the house here, we have these Thuya occidentalis uh, trees that we originally planted because we wanted to screen the neighbor on the north side. Here's American goldfinch in November eating seeds from those Thuyas. Uh, believe it, when we planted them, I don't think they were five feet tall. They're now at least 30 feet tall. And they're providing a lot of habitat and uh, food for birds. Uh, insects that, that are eaten in the trees, chickadees and juncos, I see them eating insects in those trees. And then the seeds are eaten primarily by the birds in the finch family, uh, both the goldfinch and pine siskins and house finches regularly eat all these seeds. And one year in an eruptive year for white wing crossbills, uh, we have white wing crossbills in, in the winter enjoying seeds from the thuyas. Here's a blue jay who's nesting in the thuyas. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. And you can see the little white tufts. There were three young blue jays in there. And this was hanging right off my porch and I got to watch the whole thing. It was a lot of fun. And by our side door, we have in summer in July, cardinal flower here blooming 
which I planted, I learned uh, through experimentation and also some teaching by Larry Weiner uh, to plant near the downspout, uh, both because cardinal flower likes water, but also because it turns out that cardinal flower is a, basically a biennial. It only will one plant will only last for a couple of years before it dies out. And unless you have cardinal flower going to seed, you won't have new cardinal flowers. So I decided to let me plant that by the downspout and hopefully the actual water rushing through the downspout will help spread the seed of the cardinal flower so that they get sustained in my landscape. And indeed the, the hummingbirds love cardinal flower. If you want hummingbirds, uh, if you plant cardinal flower and trumpet honeysuckle, uh, which is the native honeysuckle, most often it comes with a red flowering form, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to get hummingbirds. And that's better food for them than, than the sugar water we put in our feeders. And the great thing about cardinal flower and hummingbird is how they have this totally mutualistic relationship where the hummingbird is virtually the only pollinator for cardinal flower because the flower to corolla tube is so deep that it has to be the hummingbird uh, tongue and beak that gets in there to get the pollen on its forehead to go fertilize the next plants. So that's a, a, a good, important mutualistic relationship. And because I planted the cardinal flower by the downspout, um, indeed it worked. Here you see, this is the cardinal flower by the back door, but my little experiment worked. And so these cardinal flowers over here are ones that I didn't plant at all, but the seeds are being washed into the cracks a little further away and more cardinal flowers are coming up and voila, more hummingbirds. So when the cardinal flower is blooming, uh, every time we go to the back door, we really quietly kind of peek at it, see if we can open it and not scare the hummingbirds away. And we've never succeeded yet in opening the back door, not scaring them away, but they generally come back. Uh, higher up in the tree canopy, there are lots of other birds. Uh, there's a kingbird here in the river birch who's bleeding for insects. Uh, as I said, the the river birch in particular has this exfoliating bark, which is very nice and a great place for insects to hide and to reproduce. And so a lot of birds will glean for insects in the bark of the river birch as well as other trees. We've had sharp shins hawks hang out in the garden and sharpies for any of you that know birds like to eat other songbirds. So it's probably looking for for songbirds to eat, and as long as it would just take the non-native uh, house sparrows, I wouldn't mind. Uh, we've also had red-tailed hawks back on the top of the snag. Here comes the snag. And I have seen red-tailed hawks in our garden eating crow, eating squirrel, and I've seen them flying overhead with a rat. So I love the red tails. We need those red tails. They're very important predators in our food web and great to have in the neighborhood. So here's my snag. So a snag is nothing more than standing deadwood. And by 2008, I had was now documenting the bird species that I found in the garden. And I had actually originally planted so if, here's, a, here's sort of a bare winter view. The very middle of the back garden was, this was originally a three trunk silver maple and it was smack in the middle of the garden. And aesthetically, I wanted to move it over about eight feet, but I couldn't do that. So I planted this river birch for aesthetic reasons saying, well, once that grows large enough, I'll cut down the silver maple. But by the time it was time to cut down the last of the silver maple in 2008, I said, ah, Maybe I could get down, maybe I could get woodpeckers to nest here if I leave it up and create a snag. And so it was a little bit of a debate between my husband, Roger, and myself. He says, oh, it's not going to look good. Uh, I said, but maybe we'll get woodpeckers. And it did, it did little, look a little bit obvious at first in the winter, but you can see that in the foliage, as the foliage comes in in the season, you can hardly see the snag at all. So it really was not in any way an unpleasant element to have in the garden. And as I mentioned from my earlier picture, at this point, you couldn't see the snag at all. It really became integrated into the landscape. And I'm happy to say 
that my experiment worked. This has been, I think, the, the most fun and exciting uh, habit piece of example of habitat creation that I've done in my garden. So we cut down the, well, we turned it into a snag, meaning we topped it off so that it couldn't grow anymore in 2008. So it took five years. So this was April, 2013, and it was a very warm April. And Roger and I were sitting on the back porch and I went, oh my gosh, my experiment's working. My experiment's working because I looked over and here was this male downy woodpecker, obviously drilling a hole for a nest. And clearly he had been working at it for several days. He hadn't just started. And then the northern flicker came by to check out the hole, uh, but that hole was not abandoned, so the flicker didn't stay. And Mr. Downey came back and he worked hard on and off for several hours a day. And he worked harder and harder. And I love how he's just racing with his tail. He's working furiously digging that hole and he would bring his head out and he would spit the wood chips onto the ground below. And finally, after two weeks of hard work, he got in far enough to go all the way in and turn it, turn and bring his head out. And I'm like, okay, he's making progress. The nest is getting bigger and bigger. And then the female came by. She's a female that she doesn't have the red spot. And she seemed to inspect the hole and maybe poke it a little bit around the edges. Now, interestingly, the reputable uh, bird references will say that the male and the female downy woodpecker share the nest building. But I have to give the credit to the guy in this case, because he's the one who came and worked for several weeks. This is April 21st now. And there was a very quick fluttering that actually happened between the male and female. And I was kind of like, am I supposed to watch this? I'm not sure. But it was very fast. And then it got so quiet. And we wondered if they had been successful in the female laying the eggs. And were they re rearing a brood? And we couldn't tell because there was not a sound coming out of there and I, not much evidence of things happening for several weeks. And then on May 31st, oh my gosh, this is six weeks since I first saw the hole being drilled in this old silver maple trunk. So it's about two and a half weeks, give or take, for them to incubate the eggs. And it's about three weeks for them to actually grow enough so that they can fledge. So by this time, mom and dad, are flying back and forth. And that little guy is hanging out of the hole, just like an adolescent whining and begging for food. And here's mom. And if you can see in her beak here, she has a wad of about eight caterpillars. Woodpeckers have a barbed tongue, which allows them to pick up lots of caterpillars or bring the hole or whatever insects, other grubs, and bring them back all at once to feed their little one. And here he is begging and whining, and he's, he's also a male. He has a little red spot you can't see in this photo. And both mom and dad are feeding him like crazy. And then finally, they stop feeding him. And they're clearly waiting for this little one to fledge. And on June 1st at 3.29 p.m., six weeks since I saw the, the parents mate, he finally thrusts himself out of the hole grabs the side of the tree, climbs up to the top of the snag, rests for a minute, flies over to the service ferry, those Amalanka trees, and he's swinging in the breeze like crazy. So then he flies over to the chemistress in the middle of the yard and he just hangs there for a minute. Catches his breath. And then he starts climbing up the trunk of the tree, finding insects in the bark the entire time. And at 3.41 p.m., thank you, digital cameras, 12 minutes from fledging out of the hole, he flies out of the yard. Now, when downy woodpeckers fledge, they're done. Their parents' work is done. They don't have to feed them anymore. So maybe if you have kids, you might wish at some point you were down, downy woodpeckers, I can't say, but uh, it's pretty miraculous to see this all happen. It doesn't, it doesn't even look like just so newly fledged, like you can tell. This little one has not been out in the world before. Just, just remarkable. Now we knew there was more than, than this one in the hole because there had been some, some whining that was higher pitched and fainter. This is a female. Uh, we very creatively called her little sis, big bro and little sis. And little sis uh, clearly had been sat on by her big brother 
and Big Bro had dominated the caterpillar feeding. So little sis, uh, I monitored the whole for the next few days and, and she was weaker, but she was there uh, whining and the parents weren't feeding her a lot. And finally, after three days, I came back from a meeting one morning, I could tell she was gone. And there she was higher up in the tree, a little less vigorous than her brother, but she made some kind of whiny, fine pitched noises and then flew, she too flew out of the yard. And so I just think it's so cool to live in this urban, relatively urban area of Cambridge, Mass, and to have watched this from my back porch. I didn't get to watch things like that as a kid growing up on 100 acres because they wouldn't have nested right next to the house. And so, again, there have been a lot of other birds that come by the garden, even a scarlet tanager one year going on the way to, to uh, somewhere else where it may nest in a much more secluded spot. But I think the lesson here is that there are two big reasons that I have had so many birds in my garden. And I think the first one is that the need for habitat for these bird species is so profound and there's far too little of it and far too little for the birds to occupy that wherever we make it, they will find it because there's a shortage. And I think the other lesson is that this valuable habitat can be created very meaningfully, even on a small space in a small property. And that led to the motto for Grow Native, which is every garden matters, every landscape counts. And today I've recorded 81 bird species using my garden in Cambridge. And that would be out of about a possible give or take, uh, maybe 140 species that one could potentially see on this property. And of that, two of them are watchlist species at risk of extinction. The American woodcock, one year we had, or for three, four years in a row, we had a woodcock at migration time who would rest for about 24 hours in our garden, obviously exhausted after migration. Maybe because it is a little wet back there, spots where it could rest before it probably went out somewhere in your neck of the woods to try to find a place to mate and nest. And then, 32 of the species are, are species of moderate concern, who actually decline in bird species. I don't expect to see 81 species every year, uh, but I would hope to see 40 to 50 of them. But I, I have to say that in the last few years, I feel like there's the decline is continuing, but hopefully when I try to look at my lists, I get to see at least 40 species every year. And these are the species of moderate concern that have been used by garden in some ways since I've been documenting this since 2010. So really just documenting this in the last 12 years. And I, I'm kind of proud of that list. I think, you know, to have that, those species in my garden in Cambridge and having the garden providing enough habitat and food value uh, is a very, very wonderful thing. And just on a side note, I just want you to know the house is not quite as much of a fixer-upper as it was. We've had 30 years to work on the garden and the house. And I have this showy uh, non-native daffodils and tulips in the spring in the front that everybody who's in Oslo really loves. And once as they subside, a lot of native species that grow in after it. And, and so that's, that's my personal, personal journey where I have realized that an urban garden, every garden matters. And, and I want to just now talk about how this really does translate for all of us. As I mentioned, um, the, the clear message, every garden matters, every message counts. So I'll just tell you one more little side story. And this relates to why I think the conservation paradigm that sometimes is unconscious needs to change. So during this whole journey for me, about the year 2000, when I was really just beginning to observe the increased bird life and excited about the changes I was observing, and I would come into uh, meetings and I'd be bubbling about the birds in my garden. And a very uh, respected conservation biologist turned to me in this science meeting and he said, well, you don't think what you do in your garden matters to conservation, do you? 
And I was shocked at the time. And it, I wasn't shocked. I mean, I, I was shocked because my own viewpoint had changed and I didn't even realize how much my own viewpoint had changed. But I was also shocked by the implication that my actions on the land that I was stewarding didn't matter. Maybe that's a little bit of the four-year-old in me. It's like, don't tell me what I do doesn't matter. Um, but I was, I was seeing a lot of change and I was believing what I was observing and what I was seeing. And my ethic is, I am the steward of this piece of land. So why wouldn't I care about how I manage it to the best of its ability, to the best of its potential to support birds that I love and to support a functioning ecosystem when I was working in ecology all my life, I personally feel a certain amount of pain about what we're doing to the earth. So that question and the fact that that person asked me that question really crystallized my own thinking to say, yes, what I do matters. And I think we're all really learning that over and over. So I wanna talk in, in my next uh, 15 minutes about the five critical steps that I think are essential, the essential foundations that all of us can take as we make this change and, ex and really celebrate that our gardens, our landscapes, our schools, our institutions, wherever we are, have something to contribute to the ecology of our region. First is, I'll talk a little bit about all of these, so I'm not gonna read them, but lawn, native plants, leaf litter, habitat, and particularly on climate change, the importance of healthy soils and some whole connectivity of how this all relates uh, across the board to the climate issue. So we Americans, we know we're in love with lawn. Uh, in 2005, NASA scientists used their satellites to measure, to estimate the lawn area in the United States. And they came up with this figure of 40 million acres or 2% of the entire United States lawn, the United States land area. That is three times the higher than the amount of land in irrigated corn. It is higher than the combined land used for corn and soybean crops. And so it has a huge impact. It's lawn and, and the irrigation of lawn and the maintenance of lawn is a major contributor to water consumption and certainly shortages, if not in New England and other places in the US and so many environmental implications associated with it. I think you probably know this, but the typical soil profile for turf grass here is it's, turf grass has extremely shallow roots. It does not extend, the roots do not extend to the soil. So this wonderful graphic here, here's turf grass, and here's the grass, and here's the root system. In contrast, these are the root systems of your typical meadow plants that we might plant in our garden but it might've been there before lawn was put in instead. So the plants, the native plants that it would, would be there if this was a wet meadow in New England or if it was a dry meadow, it's a little bit more of a Midwestern uh, landscape. Those root systems are critical to soil stabilization because they're really extensive. They pretty much eliminate the need for watering. I can't say completely given the severity of the climate change fluctuation we experience now. I can't say that you won't ever have to water, but if you've got really appropriate native plants in your landscape and you get them established, they'll need far less water. And when plants are in their natural habitat, where they evolved and where they're indigenous, they don't need to be fertilized. They do, the soil regulates itself. And so you're not using artificial chemical fertilizers to keep it going the way we are for lawn. So the environmental impact of lawns are huge. Gonna, synthetic fertilizers are typically how lawns are maintained. Uh, there are very high energy uh, inputs required to produce synthetic fertilizers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them in a bit, but they're not, uh, something we really, they have a very negative effect on so many environmental, for so many environmental reasons. If you think about the health of the soil in your garden or on your landscape, we now know that chemical fertilizers, 
kill the very active food web of so many creatures that are in the soil. And then they make that dependent on you applying chemicals to grow the grass that you're trying to grow. So the very active food web that not only makes the soil healthy, but provides the ants that the flickers want to eat or the insects that the many other ground feeding birds want to eat are no longer there. And then fertilizer runoff is a major issue into groundwater, a source of nitrogen pollution and other non-point pollution. And then most lawns are maintained with herbicides and pesticides. And those are poisons and toxins that are being released into our environment each year. And then the combination of equipment, both the machinery that's used and the gasoline that's consumed is significant in the banks of lawn. So that's why there's been a lot of talk in the last uh, certainly five, 10 years about the importance of reducing lawn area. Uh, the green, the so-called green landscaping industry is probably one of the least green industries we have. And if you can reduce your lawn area, you're doing a good thing. If you do have some lawn area, you don't have to use chemical fertilizers and you can use a mulching mower or just a mower and mow, mow up your leaves so that they become the organic fertilizer to provide the nutrients for what lawn you have to grow. Um, so you don't have to have a lawn that is as chemically dependent as is typically done. Uh, but if you can replace some of that lawn, you're also doing a great thing. So step number two, native plants. Native plants, and I really mean native, are the essential food source for all of life in your local ecosystem, in our local ecosystem, et cetera. If we have a lot of non-native indigenous plants here in our New England landscapes, they're not doing much at all for the ecosystem in terms of providing for the food web, but the native plants are. So first of all, it's only plants are these miraculous uh, organisms that can capture carbon dioxide, and water and make all those sugars and food that the rest of the world eats. It's in doing that, they're creating the food that either organisms eat directly, other herbivores would eat directly, they're providing food for hummingbirds such as nectar, or they're providing food for insects, which are the intermediaries of the food webs which the birds eat, and ultimately all those sugars and carbons go up the chain to the to the herbivores, to not just the herbivores, but to the carnivores that are eating animals that eat the plants and the whole system works. We know very much that it is native plants that host the insect life and not native plants for the most part don't. And therefore, if we don't have a predominance of native plants in our landscapes, we're not gonna have insects, we're not gonna have birds, we're not gonna have toads, et cetera. The whole system won't work. And I'm guessing that that all of you know about Doug Hallamy's work. He's certainly the person who's uh, become quite famous uh, for, he's an entomologist. Uh, he was the, teaches at the University of Delaware. He's written these great books, Bringing Nature Home came out in, in 2007 and, and catapulted him to pretty much national prominence right away. And it's not that Doug was the first person to understand that, that native plants hosted insects and Insects are needed by bird life in particular. That's been known and talked about and written about by naturalists well into the, in the 1800s and early 1900s. But Doug's work has been very rigorous on this subject and he has documented uh, this much more dramatically than has ever been documented before with scientific studies. And he's a great uh, explainer in chief. So his writings and his lectures have really gone a long way to teaching all of us about this subject. So take it from Doug and if you don't know his books, I highly recommend any and all of them. He sums up the essence of the issue with this statement that his research, and as I said, this is very scientific research, has shown that native ornamental plants support 29 times more biodiversity than do alien animals. And so if we don't have native plants, we're just not gonna have life on this planet. And what's native here isn't what's native in Florida or isn't what's native in California or isn't what's native in Europe. The 
systems are localized in our ecosystem. And it is really important to, I don't think one has to be absolutely rigid. And that's a whole other topic about how native do you want to be, but understanding the regional importance of the species that did evolve, co-evolve the plants and animals together in geographic regions is essential to supporting life. And of course, if, if you are making moves to make your landscape more native, uh, whether you're doing it at step by step or whether you're doing it with a wholesale area of your garden that you want to change, then certainly focusing on trees and shrubs early on as part of your early strategy is important for all the obvious reasons. They're the ones that, that need more time to grow. They're the anchors of your landscape. Uh, really some time spent choosing the right trees and shrubs that are well adapted to your site conditions is what's gonna give you the most bang for your buck. Because you may not have the clay soil that I have. You may have something very different. And therefore, your choice of species should be affected by what soil type you have, what's your pH, how well does your soil drain or percolate. And if you pick, again, the species that are adapted to your site, they're going to survive the best, and therefore, they're going to do what you need in your garden and your landscape. Now, different species do have, to some extent, a different potential in terms of their value as hosts for Lepidopter, a lepidopter just means moths and butterfly. Again, Doug focuses on lepidoptera as a measure of value for those tree species because it is the caterpillars, the moths and the butterfly caterpillars that are very, very important bird food. And it's also something we can measure. So in terms of the genuses that are really valuable to put in your landscape, there's 20 or more genuses of native trees that you could choose. But these are the ones that he puts highest on the list in terms of how many species of Lepidoptera are hosted. Oaks in particular, uh, there are 80 species of oaks in North America. Collectively, they're known to host 517 species of moths and butterflies. But all of these native uh, trees, if you choose species that are native, are of tremendous value in your landscape. Now, let's just talk about leaf litter for just a minute. One of my favorite subjects, uh, as I've said, leaf litter is totally essential for healthy soil and for nutrient cycling. In my garden, I don't use any chemical fertilizers and I don't buy in quote unquote even organic fertilizers either. My garden is now working as a system where my fertilizer is the leaf litter and the growth of the perennials that I cut back uh, maybe later in the spring that cycles into the soil and regulates the nutrients that are there in the ground. The beautiful thing about leaf litter from a gardening point of view is that it's free. If you have trees on your property, it gets delivered every year in the fall, leaf by leaf, very gently. Over the winter, it protects the roots of your uh, plants in your garden and prevents them from drying out. And then in the spring, as your perennials come up through the leaf litter and emerge beautifully, this is your mulch for next year. You don't have to bring in other mulch if you're letting the leaf litter that comes by itself serve as your mulch. And it's very important habitat for the reproduction of a lot of uh, insect life and also food for birds. So here's a view of my garden from up on the second floor porch. As I said, I get special delivery every fall of leaves. It comes very gently. And I once had a neighborhood, uh, a neighbor's landscaping company who was blowing leaves off my neighbor's property with one of those awful leaf blowers, like really, and he started blowing the leaves off my property. And I went out and said, please leave my leaves alone. You know, those are my leaves. <laughs> and he's like, lady, if you don't blow the leaves, your plants aren't gonna come up in the spring. Well, I just wonder what the heck all these plants did a hundred years ago or 50 years ago before they were leaf blowers. But of course he wasn't uh, right. And here's low bush blueberry. 
emerging in the spring. And you'll see actually there's oak leaves and other leaf litter there on the ground that's going to become break down and become an important part of that soil. Um, here's my garden emerging in the spring. Uh, this is actually almost exactly what it looks like today uh, at this time of year. And most of the perennials that you have in your garden, it depends if you've got native perennials that are adapted to your conditions, they're going to emerge just fine through the leaf litter. There may be a few species that are sensitive to having leaves on top that wouldn't actually grow in a site that they don't get as many leaves on top, but you really will find that most of your perennials, your ferns, all kinds of plants will come up just fine through the leaf litter. And the other reason, one of the critical, critical reasons that people often don't realize about why leaf litter is so important. I'm just going to give three examples, but life depends on leaf litter. Biodiversity depends on leaf litter. So here are three examples. A hummingbird moth up on the left there, a beautiful, if you've seen hummingbird moths, you won't forget them. They don't survive from year to year. So they survive on an annual life cycle. And in order to have hummingbird moths next year, hummingbird moths have to mate and produce their larvae. And those larvae have to pupate and spin a cocoon. And they spin it in the leaf litter and that's where it overwinters. And so if we take away the leaf litter, we're taking away not just the cocoons of hummingbird moths, but the cocoons of many, many species of moths and butterfly. And we're taking away all the future hummingbird moths or species of Lepidoptera that are reproducing in that leaf litter. Now the middle picture, the morning club butterfly, actually overwinters in the leaf litter as an adult butterfly. It's it's still a miraculous to me to believe that that delicate little butterfly can survive our winters here in New England in the leaf litter, but indeed they do. And I have seen morning coat butterflies emerge at this time of year. And sometimes you'll see them and their wings are fairly tattered or a little bit tattered, which isn't surprising considering winter. But imagine that precious little creature spending that winter in the leaf litter. So again, if we get rid of it, we won't have any more morning coat butterflies. And we're all beginning to get a little more used to bees and pollinators and how important they are. The bumblebee queen is the only bumblebee to survive the winter. All the other bumblebees die off in the fall, except for the queen. And for that queen to produce a new colony next year, she has to hibernate in a little hole in the ground, usually covered by leaf litter. So those are just three examples of how leaf litter is helping preserve the life cycle of so much of the incredible creatures that we have. But not only is it preserving the life cycle for moths and butterflies and other fauna, as I've talked about many times, it's providing the insect life that is so important to birds. So it isn't surprising that again, of the bird species that we are losing and the bird populations that we're losing, many of them are neotropical migrants who have to migrate from Central America or South America here. And they're very dependent on insects in the leaf litter for their cycle, both for uh, the food that they need to survive and for feeding their young. And so leaf litter is their source. I have almost, I don't think I've ever seen uh, birds like this feeding in mulch and finding the insects that they need to survive. So if we can learn to use leaf litter as our mulch rather than bringing other uh, wood chips and things in, we will be doing a lot for improving the quality of our habitat. And then of course, there are many ways to create habitat. We've talked about snags. I would have loved to have had a beautiful artistic snag like the one that you see here. Um, I didn't happen to have one that happened to be formed just by the forces of nature on my property, so I created one. Uh, we need shrubby thickets. There's so many things where habitat can be created in creative ways on our property. Uh, putting a log just to decay, a log to decay in your garden can be a great thing to do because the plants will grow around it. You may not even notice it, but over, over this is a, this is a log I put in at one point when we were doing some tree work and I would let me put a couple logs in my garden. This is that same log 10 years later. So for 10 years, that log has been slowly decaying, providing habitat for insects, which are then providing food for birds, enriching the soil, et cetera. 
cyclone carbon in my case. And I'm offered this using the topographical features you have on your property. Um, I, as I said, I have a lot of clay, so I've had to add a lot of stones. Uh, certainly, again, if you like birds like I do, you'll notice that they love to hop up on stones. Uh, I don't think you can have too many stones. And one piece of advice if you are putting stones in your garden is after it's been in your garden for a year or two, it's going to be about half the size that you thought it was when you put it in. So put in a much, put in much bigger stones than you think you need, and then they'll probably end up being the size that you like after a few years. And then shrubs are really, really important, both evergreens and deciduous shrubs. Though not a lot of shrubby thickets left. This is on the right. This is a corn stress and mostly gray dogwood. It is a wonderful uh, plant that is loves sun. Uh, the loss of shrubby thickets is probably one of the most lost habitat types, particularly for birds in the northeastern US. Shrubs are so important for nesting and foraging for birds. And because a lot of times gardens are done with planting one shrub at a time rather than a whole mass in a thicket, it isn't going to have the same habitat. Finally, I know I'm running over a teeny bit. Just one last thing about this chemical fertilizer. And this is tied to the entire using your garden as an organic system, getting away from chemical fertilizers, and the, the vital importance of using our gardens as part of the way to address the challenge of climate change. So the rise of the chemical fertilizer industry is direct outgrowth of the manufacture of munitions in World War I, World War II. If you, it's amazing to think that until the Haber-Bosch process was invented in the early 20th century, all nitrogen for plant growth had to be produced organically, either by nitrogen fixing bacteria or by nitrogen from animal waste. So all of the entire nitrogen needed for life on earth prior to about 1920 was being produced in those organic ways. Once the Haber-Bosch process was invented, which is a way of taking inorganic nitrogen, N2, from the air and turning it into ammonia and ammonium nitrate was when chemical fertilizers essentially got invented. Now the process was invented to create munitions for World War I and World War II because ammonium nitrate is the essential ingredient for making bombs. But as bomb making was no longer needed, particularly after the end of World War II, the industry figured out, well, we can make nitrogen fertilizers and we can make well, many more chemical fertilizers. And that's what drove the whole uh, rise of chemical fertilizer production. Producing that, that ammonium nitrate and using that process is extremely energy intensive. And it produces a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of methane. And then you have to ship this stuff all over the country. And so literally, I will say to you that to use a bag of chemical fertilizer is to make a direct contribution to global warming that none of us need to do. And on a related note, there was a study done a couple of years ago by uh, the Environmental Defense Fund and researchers from Cornell. So US fertilizer plants are emitting a lot of CO2 and a lot of methane, and they're using tons of fossil fuel to create, to produce all this chemical fertilizer. Well, what the researchers in this study found, they had a little, they took a little Google car, but instead of having it map things, they put a methane sensor on top. And they found that the fertilizer plants were emitting 100 times the amount of methane that they were reporting to the EPA. And methane is a major greenhouse gas as much as CO2 is, perhaps even more so. And so again, this is just another example of the great impact of chemical fertilizer on the climate issue. Now, this is, I just had to throw this in. This is a World War I era poster because Victory gardens were very much needed in World War I. Food was in short supply, and the government was rightly encouraging people to grow food. But this a drawing by James Montgomery Flagg, who was also the famous uh, artist who did the Uncle Sam Wants Jew image, uh, with the caption, every garden a munition plant, 
I don't know if it was a deliberate connection to the idea that all these chemical fertilizers were going to be made out of essentially the munitions of war, but it's just so ironic that that's the caption. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real connection. Uh, if we use chemical fertilizers in our gardens, those are the outgrowth of the munition plants. So we definitely want our victory gardens and we want our other gardens, but we don't want to do them with, with the remnants of munitions. And then I want to come back just to the importance of healthy soils. The USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service will state emphatically that more carbon is stored in soil on planet Earth than in the atmosphere and above ground biomass combined. So soil and our importance of understanding the role of soil in carbon capture, which is in its infancy, but soil is tremendously, tremendously important. And if we have healthy soils with healthy food webs, with all kinds of creatures in it and carbon being captured by root systems and not just trees, by meadows, by all kinds of organic living flora, we're gonna be doing much better in terms of helping to address climate change. And that's why we want to garden organically and really pay attention to that, those processes. So how do we achieve this new conservation paradigm? It's all of us. If every landscape matters, every single one of us needs to be involved. And I think we are starting to understand that our human health and environmental protection and stewardship and climate change and food production, all of this is interconnected. And we have to figure out how to make it all work together. So let's show our love by reducing our lawns, planting primarily native plants, loving our leaf litter, creating habitat, and doing climate action on every front. Uh, our gardens are a place of love, and I think that's why gardeners love the garden. Uh, we love life. And yes, I am the founder of Go Native Massachusetts, and I have devoted more than a decade of my life to building the organization and building the website in particular and providing tons of resources uh, for us as an organization, for all of you to use. We want you to use them. If you don't know our website, please take advantage of it. There are so many resources on there. We have the best books, nurseries, databases to explore, information about the issue in general. And we also have a whole series of expert videos from some of, again, the Northeast United States best experts on this issue, free videos for you to watch and learn anytime you want to. I just wanna end with this beautiful quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's the author of Grading Sweetgrass. Action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And what I really like about that beautifully articulated concept is that it is the process of learning from our own gardens and learning from our love of life. We know none of us know about it. But that process of learning and learning from watching life around us is just as important as our stewardship itself. It's a two-way street. And if you don't know Robin uh, Kimmerer's book, I highly recommend that one as well. Um, it's really, she's an incredibly articulate, knowledgeable Native American woman who's, who's really has much to teach all of us. So thank you. Sorry I went over a little bit. I'm happy to stay as long as wanted for questions and yes what I do matters what we do matters to all of us to the birds to the insects the toads and the turtles and to the plants and to earth we are all in this together thank you so much hi Claudia that was wonderful Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry I went over a little bit. Outside and plant more shrubs. Uh, <laughs> Very thickets. <laughs> and thickets. Yeah, I am trying to start some thickets in my own yard. Uh, we do have some questions for you. 
Okay. Uh, some of the questions are about leaves and uh, learning the new way of using leaves in our yard. Uh, yep. Is there such a thing as leaving on too many on your lawn surface? Um, are there some rules for using leaves right if you're going to start using them as your mulch and your fertilizer? Yeah, I would say, um, again, observing what happens in our garden is, is the best teacher. I think learning from experience is a great teacher. In my experience with my the woodland portion of my garden, um, there are almost no plants, as I said, that won't come up through that leaf litter just fine. Now, the difference you'll notice, I have a neighbor who's a landscape architect whose approach is very different from mine. He gets rid of every leaf <laughs> and his plants come up a little sooner because he's letting that, that sun is hitting them faster. But mine come up just fine. And so for example, something like maidenhair fern, if you know it, which is really delicate, or I didn't have a lot of time on to show the leaf litter pictures, but if all those woodland wildflowers that I'm growing are adapted to coming up through the leaf litter in the woods. Now, if you, if you really, there are certainly are spots in the woods where some species would come up through the leaf litter better than other, but one, one of my favorite natives, for example, is myanthemum candidates. If you know it, myanthemum candidates is this small, some people call it the native lily of the valley. It's about a third the size of lily of the valley. And in your neck of the woods, you, there are a lot of spots where there are mixed oak pine woodlands. And you'll see this beautiful carpet of myanthemum candidates, which is very delicate wildflower come up right through the oak leaves and the pine needles every spring. So it's adapted to do that. So one thing is to know about plant communities and start to know what plants evolved in communities together. And if those plants live together in plant communities, they're very adapted to coming straight up through. I would say that, again, there are just a few species. For example, I have some uh, woodland phlox, phlox stolonifera. I have some uh, phlox subulata. Those are a little sensitive to having leaf litter on top. And so I will gently rake the leaf litter off some of those in the spring as they're emerging. But for the most part, I leave, I, I let my, my ferns and my wither wildflowers, I have trilliums at peak right at the moment. I'll have Jack in the pulpits in a few weeks and they come up through just fine because they're adapted to do that. Uh, so try it, watch it. Uh, and while, if you have, woodlands in your area where you can also, especially this time of year, walk and watch what's happening there, you'll get the sense of how the plants will come up through the leaf litter. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we also have a question uh, from one particularly hard, hardworking gardener who has really been uh, taking out a lot of invasive plants and now has moved on to taking out healthy non-native plants. And mm -hmm really feels bad about throwing them away. So uh, what do you suggest that people do as they begin to remove non-native shrubs and perennials from their yard? Should they all be going on the burn pile or should they, you know, give them to your neighbors and let them worry about their yeah. own ecology or? It, I totally get the sentiment. Um, I, as I, I mean, first of all, as I said, when I started gardening, I didn't know that natives were what I would ultimately decide would be the, my choice. Um, I went to Weston Nurseries in 1993 when we had took down that cruddy old garage and, and I bought what looked pretty and a lot of it wasn't native and some of it was, and it wasn't until years later that I started consciously making the change. And so I did end up, as I evolved my garden over that first, say, 15 years, then taking out a lot of what I'd actually planted. And I had that same dilemma of like, you know, it, 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 it's growing fine. It what I did was sometimes I got rid of it. If it was an aggressive plant, I had no problem saying, you know, this is really too aggressive and I'd rather not give it to a friend or a neighbor. I did have one neighbor who had so many invasives. He had so much gout weed and so many horrible, truly invasive plants that he was trying to get rid of that I did 
I guess, pawn off some of my some of my non-native plants to him that weren't super aggressive ones that I felt like he didn't have a lot of money to buy plants. And so I was helping him because he was getting rid of gout weed. And I was giving him tons of plant material for free that he could use. So I think that that was a good thing. So, you know, I, I, I think you have to kind of make your own judgment call on that. Uh, if, it's, if it's an aggressive plant, I would not give it away. So if it was Vinca, which isn't on the prohibited plant list, but I think is, is an ecologically damaging plant, quite frankly, or doesn't have any ecological value, let's put it that way. Certainly anything like that, I would not give it away. That's like, boy, man, get that stuff ground up and get that out of it. But if it was a, some non-native ferns, again, it's, there's, there's not necessarily always a hard and fast right answer. Mm -hmm. um, well, and another thing that's shown up in our questions is, is about, you know, how do you start? It's one thing to know that there is a problem and that you understand it and you think it's important. And it's another thing to walk out in your yard and look at it and think, good grief, where do I start first? Uh, that's one of the things that I love about the um, Grow Native Massachusetts website. I have used it a great deal myself. We do have a page for beginners with some <laughs> ideas about that. Um, you'll find it in the Know Your Landscape uh, menu. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, I think certainly if you're going to start to make some changes, if I am an advocate for developing some kind of concept for where you'd like your garden to go, even if you're not going to do it all at once. So I would say one great thing to do is to think of what assets does your site have? What is it that you like about your site? that can give you clues about what you might want to plant or what type of habitat you want to create. So if I were to, to do my journey over, mm -hmm. I would have wanted myself to know 30 years ago was like, yeah, this was a major brick manufacturing site. You got nothing but clay here, kid. So find out what, what likes clay. Find out, you know, and just go with that. I could have done in my back if I had taken that attitude, a grove of maybe river birches and a few other species and all kinds of understory plants that are adapted to that and just let it be that kind of alternate, almost, it's not a floodplain, but, but that type of habitat. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would start by trying to figure out what you think the strengths of your site are, because then if you work with those, that's great. And then I, I, I do would, I would start with some trees and shrubs because those are going to have the most ecological significance in terms of being hosts for insects and particularly lepidoptera that will help with bird life and with building the food web that you want to have. Okay, and it's great. easy, you know, it's so easy to move perennials around. And if you kill off a few perennials, you don't mind it as much as if you spend 150 bucks on a tree and it's not the right tree and then right place or else you t later have to ask your husband to help you move it because you didn't plan it in the right place. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I think that covers the questions. Uh, before we close tonight, I'd like to show you and your audience what I'm going to be up to this summer. And I'm going to share a screen if I can find it. Uh, let's see. Seems to be hiding from me. All right, I'll just describe what I'm going to be doing. Um, how do I close that? Is that closed? Um, all right, I can't get my, my exhibit up, but uh, this summer I'm going to be working with people who are interested in beginning the conversion of their yards from non-native plants to native plants. And I'm going to be doing this um, under the auspices of the uh, Native Plant Systems Task Force, uh, an entity that is part of, oh, well, thank you. There's my, there's my exhibit. <laughs> uh, we're looking at how we can help people take this step to um, move from being enthusiastic about native plants and preserving biodiversity to actually taking action. And so I'm 
going to do a program of site visits to people who are interested and go out and talk to them about their objectives for their yard, what they'd like to accomplish, and then provide a little guidance about how they might begin um, and help them find the resources they need, where the plants can be purchased, where you might be able to find professionals who are truly knowledgeable about native plants. And uh, as a result of making these visits, I'm going to gather information to share with my colleagues uh, to just talk about how we might help people uh, more effectively begin this process. So um, when we send out the link uh, that of the recording of your program, Claudia, we're also going to send a link uh, to my little project here in hopes that anyone who would like to have a visit in the area around Wayland, where I live, in one of the adjacent towns, I'd be delighted to come out, be your gardening pal, and uh, help you take the first step in doing a, a, a conversion or at least an enhancement to your yard. So I'm excited about it. I hope I'm able to help some people put their feet on this path. And um, we owe a lot, all of us, uh, to people like you, Claudia, who have been leaders in this area and helped us all begin to understand that we have a real role to play in conservation and establishing a healthy ecosystem. We would have, wouldn't be doing it without the, the inspiration you've provided. Thank you. Yes, and thank you. And, and also, Jean, that's uh, very generous of you. Uh, thank you very much, too. And of course, thank you, Claudia, for helping us understand how we can be better stewards of our yards, as Jean said. Uh, what we do matters, as you said, no matter how small our yard is. And it looks like it's going to be a good weekend to get out there in the garden. Um, and when you're not out in your garden, I do recommend you go online and check out Grow Native Massachusetts. I discovered it about a year ago, and it is an amazing resource with just chock-a-block full of information. So once again, the session was recorded and will be available shortly on our website and our YouTube channel, as are the previous Metro West Climate Solutions sessions. The URL, once again, is metrowestclimatesolutions.org. We're gonna be taking a break this summer. We hope to see you again in the fall. So thank you for joining us and good night, everybody.